July 2007, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew made his now famous golden period speech. He had said, we are into a period of good economic growth. If there are no wars or oil crisis, this golden period can stretch out over many years. Investors from developed economies are pouring money into East and Southeast Asia. Not only was Singapore doing swimmingly, Lee said that it was he and his ministers that made all this possible. Lee said that it is because a competent and experienced team of ministers took painful and unpopular measures in the last few years since the Asian financial crisis to get our domestic policies to encourage growth. Now I want you to pay particular attention to this because I want to contrast it to what Princeton economist and Nobel laureate for economics, Professor Paul Krugman said. Professor Krugman said, when Asian economies delivered nothing but good news, it is easy for policymakers to look competent in a prosperous economy, but they may not have a clue. So, who is right? Lee, who says that it was he and his ministers, or Krugman, who said they may not have a clue? Let's take a look, closer look at this. Barely one year later, let alone many that, Lee had predicted that our golden period would stretch. Our economy came to a crashing halt. In the fourth quarter of 2008, our GDP plunged precipitously, triggering the worst economic recession in our history. Remember, there was no war. There was no oil crisis. There was the meltdown of the financial system in the U.S. Obviously, Lee was oblivious to all these developments. Between 2003 and 2007, a credit and housing bubble had been, built, had been building up. And there were unmistakable signs. In August 2006, Yale economist Robert Schiller warned that there was significant risk of a very bad period serious trouble in the financial markets. The following year, Dr. Nouriel Roubini, the world-renowned economist who was credited with predicting the U.S. crisis, he said, the credit bubble was building up in the U.S. The party will soon be over, and there would be pain for the global economy. Three months later, Billionaire financier Warren Buffett warned that there was an electronic herd of people managing an amazing amount of money throughout the world. But he said that this was a fool's game. He warned that all this buying and selling of derivatives was we were dealing with weapons of mass destruction. Despite all this that was going on, Lee came and told us, in July 2007, that we were entering a global, a golden period. And his were not mere words. In fact, he had told Singaporeans to go out and maximize our opportunities. And this is precisely what the GIC did. Tony Tan, Dr. Tony Tan, who was then a humble executive director at the GIC before he became president, had invested $10 billion, and I'm quoting everything in U.S. dollars. He had put $10 billion in the Swiss bank, UBS, because he had said that in the case of UBS, they have a worldwide global wealth management business, which is something not replicable by any bank. And so in December 2007, Dr. Tony Tan put in $10 billion of our dollars into 
the Swiss bank. Now this is in spite of the fact that in the second half of 2007, UBS had written down $33 billion. The following year, it announced a total loss of $17 billion. Two years later, it admitted to defrauding the U.S. government and was fined $780 billion. Its chief, Raoul Whale, had to step down and has hence been declared, since been declared, a fugitive by the U.S. authority. It gets worse. About a month after GIC put the money into UBS, Dr. Tan plowed in another $7 billion, this time into Citigroup. He said that Citi is a sound bank, temporarily facing significant problems, but their franchises are strong. I want you to compare this with what Noriel Rubini said. Over the course of the last 80 years, Citi has repeatedly overextended itself and teetered on the bank, on the brink of insolvency, only to bounce back thanks to government forbearance and bailouts. Any bank that needs that much help does not deserve to exist. Sure enough, nine months after GIC put the $7 billion in, Citibank announced that it was on the verge of bankruptcy and needed more bailout money. This bailout money came in the form of the asset, trouble asset relief program that the U.S. government had poured in to the tune of about close to a trillion dollars. If the government, U.S. government had not bailed this bank out, the bank, together with our $7 billion, would have been no more. And as if not to be outdone by her counterparts at the GIC, Ho Ching, the chief executive of Tomasic Holdings, she paid $4.4 billion for a 9.4% stake in Merrill Lynch. Now, folks, I want you to pay particular attention to this timeline because it's very important. It was just about the time when Tony Tan and the GIC invested in City and the UBS. By now, the banking troubles in the U.S. had grown into a full-blown crisis. In March 2008, Bear Stearns, the fifth largest bank in the U.S., collapsed because it had, couldn't sustain its losses due to the exposure to the subprime crisis and the toxic assets. Shortly thereafter, Lehman's followed suit and collapsed as well. And the crisis threatened to go up the chain to eat up all the banks, including Merrill Lynch, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Goldman Sachs, and so on. So it wouldn't be a surprise that by now Merrill Lynch had been losing money. In July 2008, Merrill announced, announced another two quarters of losses. Incredibly, despite all this, Tomasic upped its stake, its stake in Merrill to 14%. Why? Because Ho Ching felt that Merrill Lynch was a great franchise. Notice the similarity of words used between her, by her, and Tony Tan. And that she had great confidence in Merrill's CEO, John Thane. Two months later, Merrill announced that it couldn't sustain its losses as well and was taken over, bought over by Bank of America. After Merrill went into Bank of America, John Thane was forced to step down. Why? Because he had not fully disclosed all of Merrill Lynch's losses. And before Merrill went under, 
John Thing saw it fit to pay authorized payments to all the top executives at the bank, totaling $3.6 million in bonuses, dividends, salaries. And while all this was happening, all the troubles, the crisis was happening, John Fain, in whom Ho Ching had great confidence, had sought fit to spend $1.2 million to refurbish his office, including paying $87,000 for a rug, $25,000 for a table, another $87,000 for, $87, for guest chairs, $35,000 for a commode, that's a toilet bowl to you and me, and $1,400 for a waste paper basket. Of course, it was made of parchment. That's why it was expensive. Folks, in case you're wondering where all our CPF savings have gone to, there's your answer. You know, the list of it just reads like a what's what in the land of zombie investment. My friends, this is an insane position to be in. Our national wealth, all our CPF savings, all our budget surpluses are controlled by two entities. One headed by the Prime Minister, the other by his wife Ho Ching. And neither of which we have any say in. We don't know in the first place how much there is in these two funds. We have no idea how and where these investments are being invested, and we have absolutely no clue of the returns on these investments. Of late, Professor Chris Balding at the Peking University tried to tally the pronouncement made by these two funds with the limited information that's available out there. It was like trying to square a circle. His conclusion is that the numbers just don't add up. No people, no people in the world, in the democratic world, in the sane world, in the pragmatic world, would allow themselves to be exposed to and in such a vulnerable position. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking for trouble. And the danger is that we will find it. My friends, ask that Singaporeans who do, Singaporeans like you and I, must press ahead with an arduous but noble effort of making into reality that idea, that hope, that dream of democracy that has eluded our nation for too long. Let us not yield. Let us not kneel. Instead, let us stand up like men and women with all our transgressions, with all our fears, with all our imperfections. Let us stand up and rattle that cage of oppression. Let us defy those who would put our minds into cages, our eyes into blinkers, and our souls into mortuaries. Let us take the journey to the place where we will know truth and then truly know what it is to be free, to be honest, to be human. Thank you.